<laughs> uh, how's everybody doing today? Yeah, yeah, it is good to be here. It's good that even though we're not, we don't have the sun like we usually do, we are all, or like we should have in the spring, we are all alive here in church and God got us all here safely, so we are thankful for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and pray and get started today. Father, um, we thank you. Thank you that you are good. Thank you that, that you brought us in here safely, Lord. Um, we pray for Charlotte, uh, Alyssa, and James, uh, Kern's little one who's running a fever, Lord. We pray that you're hand would be on her, um, that you would bring James and Alyssa peace uh, during this. Um, let them know that you're in control and you are there, and we thank you for that, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would bless the reading of your word today, um, that you would speak to our hearts, let us know exactly what you intended for us to know through your word, Lord. Um, help us to, to keep it in, to listen, to obey it. Um, we thank you for the authority that it has in our lives, Father. Uh, we thank you and we praise you, Jesus. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. All right, so um, today we're going to continue our series on the parables of Jesus. Um, today is the parable of the sower. It's in Luke 8. So if you, uh, if you want to grab your Bibles and get to Luke 8, um, we will be there shortly. So I've seen seen a lot of different reactions to the gospel being proclaimed. Um, I've seen some people try to change the subject because it just makes them uncomfortable. Um, some seem to become bitter and, and angry at the mere mention of God. Some, and I think, I think this is the saddest one, I talk to people who, I've talked to them about Jesus and his love for them and, and the gospel and what the cross means and what he had done. And, you know, they'd walk away in tears, but they would still walk away without ever accepting what he had done. But there's one instance that's, that's always, it's just stuck out to me. Um, me and Jenny were in uh, jail ministry at the Clark County Jail, and we would go there and uh, pass out Bibles and... Um, cookies, pray with the inmates, give them socks, stuff like that. And uh, I would always ask them, you know, if they needed prayer. They have different pods. So at Clark County, it's second, third, fourth, and fifth levels. And it starts with the lowest, with like the least um, serious offender. And then at the fifth, you have people that are just waiting to go to the pen. They're in there for um, penitentiary, um, prison. They're in there for like uh, attempted murder, murder. Uh, domestic violence, all kinds of the, the worse stuff. And uh, so they have them all separated in different pods on different levels. So we would go to the different pods and just pray for people and, and talk to them. Uh, went up to, to this, one, um, this one pod, and I believe it was on the fifth floor, and there was, uh, there was a bunch of, we were, we were talking about Jesus, and I was asking them, if they needed prayer and how we can pray for them. And, you know, some of the guys kind of kind of laughed. It's just what they, they, they just wanted to keep their hardened exterior. They didn't want to want to think about Jesus. They thought it was funny. Um, and then there was another guy that was in the corner, and he was by himself. And these, these inmates were like, hey, you need to go talk to this guy. You need to talk to this guy over here. His name is Justin. And he didn't want to come over and talk to me at all, but they actually got him to. They, they convinced him to come over and, and talk to me. And so I explained the gospel about how we are in our sins and Jesus died to save us. And that if we just accept his sacrifice, we could be made new. And, and I, I explained to him about how how much God loved him that he just went to the cross on his behalf and that he could be free even while being in jail. And, uh, you know, 
he broke down and right then and there in the jail cell. And this isn't the only time this has happened, but with this kind of instance, for this the sake of the story, um, he, he accepted Jesus and, into his heart, into his life. And I always, I always thought about that because you have this, this room full of, there's 20, 20, 20 to 25 inmates in there. And I'm not trying to be judgmental, but common sense tells you that most of them probably don't know Jesus, right? Like, you're, you're in jail. And, um, and their response to what I was saying just makes me think they, they didn't know Jesus. But there were some that just laughed. Like, it just, the, the gospel just hit them and bounced off. Like, they didn't get it. And, and there were others that, that understood what I was saying, but they're like, I don't, I don't want it. And then there was, there was one who it just penetrated their heart, and it changed them. Like, God moved. And, and that makes me wonder, like, why does this happen? Like, how, how, how is it that some people hear the gospel and do nothing, and, and others hear it and they run to it? And uh, Jesus explains that, why this happens today and uh, this parable. So Luke 8, verse 4 is where we'll start. And when a great crowd was gathering and people went from town after town, came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock. And as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the first thing we need to realize in this, like so much of what Jesus taught, is this is a heart issue. Because here's what's happening with this, this story. This, the sower of the story is spreading the truth of the gospel. The seeds are representative of, of the sower telling people about Jesus. And the different kinds of soil, as Jesus would explain, are different conditions that people find their hearts in when they hear it. It goes on in uh, verse 11, 11 through 15. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they might not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Um, there are verses in between... Um, the first part of the parable and Luke 11, but that is a, um, a lesson in and of itself is talking about why Jesus gives us these in parables. So we will get to that in this sermon series. Um, but we all have at least one person that we pray for and just wonder why they don't come to Jesus, right? Like we all have that person. We know that if they did, they would find a truer life. Their lives would change so much better if they knew them. We know people like this. And I'm not saying things would be perfect when this person gives their life to Jesus. But we know they would find so much more fulfillment than they are now without them. Right? They would find wholeness, love, healing, and purpose. But, but they won't accept them. And it's like, no matter how many times they've heard about them, how many sermons they've heard preached, how clear you can be with the gospel and letting them know this, it's almost like they're blind to the truth, right? And it's because they actually are. Jesus would say that these are the hearers along the path. They hear the gospel, but before it can take root, the devil comes in and takes away that truth. He distorts their mind and blinds them to it. Corinthians says it like this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4. the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, 
that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So it's insanely frustrating, right? Like when someone we know and someone we love and we care about won't accept Jesus into their life. Like we, we know they're blinded. We know they need Jesus. And it's almost like we kind of want to beat them over the head with the Bible. And I, I, I don't know how many times I've said that to Jenny. I just, like, just want to smack this dude with the Bible because he just he needs it. I'm not talking about anybody in the church. So if, I don't want you guys going away saying, Pastor Matt, so he's going to hit me with the Bible. That's not what I was talking about. Um, because it's just like they, they won't and can't listen. And, and the Bible says that they can't. The devil has blinded them to it. I used to go, to go hunting all the time. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't been able to go lately. I really want to. I want to get back out in the woods. But one thing I used to do was I would become just about invisible to the deer. It's, it's funny, all my cousins and stuff, they have all these names um, for themselves as hunters because we're just a redneck family. Um, <laughs> there's like the quiet storm and the deer slayer and this kind of stuff. Um, Mine, I don't have a name for me. The deer just know me as he who must not be named. <laughs> but I, w- I would put on my camo, uh, real tree hardwoods is what I, I went with. I'd be from head to toe, and I would get serious about it. And I'd actually, I'd seal all my clothes away, and so they didn't, like, get, the, we have dogs in our house. I didn't want the deer to smell the dogs and stuff like that. Sometimes... I'd even go out and start like a campfire that morning and I would actually like stand in it because the thing is, is like deer have smelled that for so long, it's almost in their DNA, like they smell smoke that they, they're, <laughs> you guys ever seen Zootopia? <laughs> Eliotto was watching it the other day and this fox goes, it's in our dinner and he was talking about DNA. So anyways, sorry, squirrel. But um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So I, I would get in the smoke because the deer, it, it disguises it. The deer used to smell that, and it's okay to them. Um, kind of like masking my sin, you know. And, I, and I'd get out in the woods like an hour before the sun came up. And uh, deer would just wake up, and they would walk by, and they would not even know I was there. They would have no idea it was there until it was too late. And this is kind of what the enemy does to hear the gospel, or to those who hear the gospel on the path. He completely blinds people to it. And sometimes, until it's too late, they simply can't see it. It's veiled, disguised to them. They can't see the beauty in it. But take heart in this. I want you to, to hear me on this. This parable also shows us how we can pray for them. And we're going to get to that. Then there are those on the rock. And these, these are the people who hear it, and they quickly fall away. And we know people like this too, right? Like people who have heard it and seem to be saved, and as soon as a trial hits, they fall away. They walk away from God. And they start out almost on fire, it would seem, right? Like talking about it. The Bible says that they receive it with great joy. But here's what isn't there. Trust. It says that during testing, they fall away. So what's that tell us? That when trials and tribulations come, they don't lean on God. And they don't trust God to get them through it. It tells us that the relationship they had with God was never real. It couldn't be. Like, you have, to, you have to trust to have a real relationship with someone. Could you have a real and honest relationship with, with your spouse if, if there was no trust there? Or even with, with a friend or an acquaintance or a coworker? Like, you have to have trust to have a real relationship. Especially with God. Because in order to be saved, we have to trust in his finished work on the cross, right? Like, that's how we know Jesus. That's how we're saved. 
We trust in what he has done. So we have to trust God by definition to know him, to be, to be a Christian, to follow Jesus. Trust is, is huge in our relationship with God. Trust even takes the fear out of things because even, even the bad news that seemed to have plagued the person whose seed fell on the rock, trust would have taken that fear away for them. The Bible tells us that the man or, man or woman of God isn't afraid of bad news. Psalm 112, 7 says, he is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. And we trust in his faithfulness and the truthfulness of his word. Psalm 33, 4, for the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. We trust that he is our refuge. Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So those who are on the rock and are, or whose seeds were sowed on the rock, they, they may feel sincere, but though there is no real sincere trust. And, and when the hard times come, and they will, we know this. We who know Jesus know this. Hard times come, right? Like this doesn't exempt us from going through hard times. When the hard times come for them, their lack of trust will be exposed, and they fall away trying to fix things themselves. Then there's the seed who fell among the thorns. Again, these, these are people who seem to have heard the gospel and, and accepted it, but there's no real relationship there. there. There couldn't be. Like, there seems to be, right? It says that they go on their way and they are choked out. So, Cares, riches, pleasures of life, uh, these are all thorns and thistles that do damage. That's, this is what the Bible is getting at. I think, I think again, when, when it comes to this seed, this is about trust. Trust, devotion, and, and love. What I've noticed about this is Thorns and thistles are on plants that, that often have something on them to make them attractive. But, but when you carelessly go to grab them, they hurt you. Like, look at a rose. It's a, it's a beautiful flower, right? I told myself I wasn't going to say this. Every rose has its thorn. <laughs> Y'all knew I was going to do it, right? I, I was like, when I was going over this, I was like, don't say it, Matt. And I'm, I said it. <laughs> so if, it's beautiful though, right? But if you were to grab that flower without, without being careful, you're going to get stabbed. It's, it's the same thing with pleasures in this life. There are, are plenty of things in this, this world that are pleasurable, that are right and, and good. Things that I think God blesses us with and, and should bring a sense of joy and worship to our heart. I think, I think the trouble comes when you start separating the creation from the creator and you start worshiping it over him. We know that God alone is to be praised and not his creation. Uh, Romans 125 says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than, than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Um, this, this passage that I brought that out of is a sermon series in and of itself. I mean, that'll preach. It talks about in Romans 1.20 how all of creation, all of creation shows and glorifies that it has a creator, that God made it, and that the people that see this and claim there's no God, they're without excuse because the world is so glorious, wonderful, and, and crafted in such an intrinsic way that you have to fight to say there isn't a God. Like, God has made it absolutely clear. But, to get back to it, I think the person in the thorns 
is one that once found great beauty in Jesus. I, I think they did. I think they, they loved him, and they wanted to worship him. But I think they started to love what the Lord provided more than the Lord himself. I think they started to find their fulfillment and joy in things other than God. So, I don't know, hopefully I can explain this right because I don't have it in my notes. It just kind of... So, um, oftentimes I've heard that don't love God because he gives you things. Love God for who he is. But here's the thing that, that I have found. Don't love the things that God gives you for, for, who they, for what they are. But here's the thing. You can't separate God being a good gift giver and not loving him for that because that's who he is too. God is a God who gives good gifts. He's a God of love who loves to bless his children. So you don't have to take that away. I don't know where that came from, that it has to be over here, over here. God is a God who blesses us with gifts. That's who he is. It's okay to love him for that. Now, I am not saying by any means that we should love him because we have stuff, because God is worthy to be praised and worshiped without having things, and he is worthy to be praised and worshiped. And for the cross alone, my goodness, if he didn't, if he just, if I was the thief on the cross who got nothing but salvation from Jesus and I didn't get gifts and, and all of these different things, goodness gracious, take my heart, Lord. You're, you are worthy of everything I have. But anyways, that, that to say, you don't have to separate the two. God is a good God, and he is a, a giver of gifts and it's okay to love him for who he is. But just remember that who he is is a God that loves to bless his children. You don't have to separate the two. But when you start to love the creation and things that, that are not him more than him, that's when we have an issue. And I, I think that's, this is what happened with, with this person among the, whose seed was sown among the thorns. I think they started to find their fulfillment and joy and things other than God. And I think this leads to trusting the world and its ways more than trusting completely in Jesus. And this way leads not only to a life of sin, but a love for that sin. And, and since you love that sin, and God is a God who doesn't let us stay in that sin because he loves us so much, he's going to convict us, right? He's not going to let us stay there. So what happens if you love that sin and you start to love it more than God and God's saying, come back this way? You're going to go all in on the sin, right? Which I think is what happened with the seed on the thorns. He, he, wanted, to, he wanted to love his sin more than he wanted to love God. And this is a danger, dangerous spiral. It leads to death. Uh, James 1.15 says that then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Sin is a horrible thing, man. I, I, it gets sugar-coated sometimes. But how horrible is it if the Son of God had to die to rescue us from it? You know? Like, and don't get it twisted, man. The Bible is clear. God hates sin. He hates it. When we find ourselves, we think among the thorns, we need to ask God to, to clear that away. Because let me just say that the world does this all the time. The world loves God's creation. Even those who don't believe it came from God, even those who don't believe he exists, they love nature, they love joy, laughter, possessions. The world loves these things. They love to have choices. They don't want to give credit to the one who gave it to them. 
the world, you can get on the internet, man. It's all over the place. Huge problem, even among churches, even though churches won't admit it. It's a problem. People love sex. They love pornography. But they don't want to use it in a way that God has told us it should be used. God has given that to us not as a bad thing, but in a way to be used with his, his word in a way that glorifies him, right? But that's what Satan does. He comes and twists things and makes them ugly and bad. The world loves food. They love to be able to eat, but they won't for a, think for a second to give thanks to the God who provided food for them. They love and trust themselves and create, and they trust creation for their joy and their life. But then this, this parable goes on to the seed in the soil. And this is the man or woman of God, the one who has the root in good soil. He doesn't trust creation, but is created. Psalm 27 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. You know, I see these things all the time. Um, I'll come across videos and stuff like that, people showing off their Lambos and, and Lamborghinis and Ferraris and all this kind of stuff, and I just kind of scoff like Adam, like this is where they find their identity, their joy, their fulfillment. Part of me might scoff a little bit because I think it would be cool to ride around in one for a second. <laughs> but... My trust and my fulfillment and joy and, and where I find peace, what I find to rescue me in this world isn't in, in cars and possessions, which is what this person in Psalm 20 that David was talking about, said, some trust in chariots and some in horses. It could be the same right now with Lamborghinis and Ferraris. We can't find our joy in those things, in material things which, by the way, every material thing ever created, ever made by the hands of man, was fashioned by something that God had spoken to existence. They'll never forget that. Man cannot do what God does. Man can manipulate materials and use it, but it's God who's given us those things. It's God who's given us those materials. It's God who's given us the minds to be able to do that. Everything you see comes from God. Every good and perfect thing comes from God. So the one who has the word grown in their heart, the man or woman of God, they've seen Jesus for who he is. Perfect, full of mercy, love, and grace. They, they have seen Jesus and know that he is far above anything the world has to offer. They don't follow out of, out of obligation or begrudging duty but because they have seen that he is beautiful and they can't take their eyes off him. These are the ones whose hearts have been broken over their sin and, and have just been wrecked by the love of Jesus despite that sin. They talk about him and tell people about him not because they have to, but because they realize that he's so good that they can't shut up about them. They bear fruit naturally because the seed that was planted in their heart blooms and the fruit is the result of what Jesus has done. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The man or woman of God whose seed was planted on good soil are those who have seen and tasted that the Lord is good. They lack nothing that they need. They stand upright, peace, love, and joy flowing from the seed that God is producing in their hearts. One thing I want you to, to see in this is at the end of this parable, it says that, that they bear fruit with patience. It doesn't say that it's done all at once. So you're sitting there, if you're, if you're like me, who I fall so short of where I need to be, and I'm humbled because Jesus chases after me anyway to claim more of me, to call me his own. And I, and I, I, 
I don't deserve it. But if you're like me, you'll read that and you'll be like, my goodness, that's, that's not me. Notice that Jesus says, bearing fruit with patience. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with yourself. Jesus certainly is. When I, when I look at this parable, I see a few ways that we can apply lessons in our life. One is notice that the sower doesn't prejudge the soil, right? Like he sows the seed of the gospel, and he trusts God to do, to do the growing. He doesn't, he doesn't look and say, oh, well, God is going to grow these people. God's going to work here. No. The sower tells people about Jesus. He tells them. He trusts God to do what only God can do. In the same way, it's not up to us to sow seeds because we don't think they're going to listen. It's not up to us. God says proclaim the gospel, so we proclaim. He tells us to do, so we do. Another thing I've noticed is that, that even for us who know Jesus, those thorns and distractions can start to choke us out too. I, I grew up um, not on a big mega farm or anything, but a, a farm outside of, um, outside, in between Enon and Springfield. And uh, I used to have to get up early in the morning and pull weeds. My goodness, I hated it. I'm cringing just thinking about it. Um, we would have, like, tomatoes and corn and, and all just different kinds of stuff planted. But one thing I noticed is that if you didn't get out there every day, if you let those weeds go for a while, they would start to grow up everywhere, and they'd start to choke out those plants. This, this field needed routine maintenance to keep it up, to keep it in check, to keep the weeds down. So do we. We need the same thing. So does our heart. We need to continually check and make sure that our mind and our heart are focused on the one true treasure that we have, Jesus. The eternal treasure that we have. The last thing I want to mention in this is we talked about people we loved being blinded by the enemy. We talked about the seeds falling and the trust not being there and, and love for the world choking out the truth. And you probably... If you've got people you're praying for, you've probably got somebody in mind. You probably are thinking about somebody right now um, that you just would love for them to, to listen and, and let the gospel just sink in and come to know Jesus. First thing I want to say to you is don't give up. Don't give up. And I believe God wants you to know that, man. Don't give up. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep talking to them about Jesus. Keep sharing the gospel. Here's what I wanna, how I want to ask you to pray for them. Pray for the seed of the gospel of Jesus to fall on good ground in their heart. And this, is, this is from this parable. Pray for their hearts to be fertile ground that accepts the gospel. Pray for protection from the enemy and his schemes to rob them of the truth. Pray for God to crack the rock around their hearts and let the root grow deep. Pray, pray that the thorns would be cleared away and, and pray that he would be glorified in this. Um, we're going to open up the altar for prayer for a few minutes. Um, and during this time, you can, you can come up here to the front. You can do it in your seat. Um, whatever you feel comfortable with, if you want prayed for during this time, just raise your hand. Um, I want to ask you to do a heart check. If you have distractions and joys in this world that are, that are creeping up around you, I want to give you the opportunity to ask Jesus to clear him away and help you bring your focus back on him. 
Just use this time to do a maintenance check on your heart. And then I want to ask you, if you have someone that you've been praying for or, or thinking about, and you just, you want God to come in and do a work, I want to invite you to come and, and bring them to Jesus. Lay them down at the foot of the cross and let Jesus do what only he can do. Let him work on the heart. Let him come and, and, and do what only he can do. We talk about trust, right? Put them in God's hands. We trust Jesus. Let Jesus work in them. And I want to invite you, if there's somebody that you want constantly prayed for, come see me. I'll put their name on my wall, and I will just pray for them every day. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and use this time to, to pray. Uh, if, you, if you need somebody to pray with you, please just raise your hand, and uh, somebody will come and pray with you. Lord, we thank you that you are a good God who hears our prayers. I uh, thank you for the, the people who have been brought before you today, Lord. Father, I want to ask that you would do a supernatural work in these people's hearts, Father. I pray that, that the people that have been praying for them would be encouraged and lifted up and that you would let them know, Lord, that they're in your hands and that you love them even more than we possibly could. Or I think of, of our children and how, how our heart just overflows and, and we have so much love for them and it's, it's a scary kind of love. 
because of how much we love them. Lord, your, your love for even our own kids are so much more than what we could, we could even imagine. I was just reading in your word this morning that, that your love is beyond our knowledge. We can't even begin to grasp it, Father. So it's just so reassuring to know that we can come and bring these, these people before you and you don't respond with, with I don't care or anything like that. You are, I know, I'm working on it. I love them. I love them even more than you do, and I am working on it. I am not finished, and we're so thankful for that, Father. Pray that you would encourage my brothers and sisters to keep on pressing in, to keep on, um, to be like, be like the person that just keeps on begging and begging and begging the judge, and that he finally relents and gives them that, Father. I pray that you would just instill in them new energy and new new clarity to go after, to seek you, and that they just would not be, be tired of this and just seek your will in this person's life that they're praying for, Jesus. Um, pray all these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, so we're going to do something a little bit different before we leave. Um, we have... Man, some of you guys are like kind of, I saw, I saw the fear in your eyes, like I'm about to call y'all up here or something like it. I said, <laughs> man, just know I ain't trying to do that to any of y'all, like unless I've talked to you beforehand. That's a scary feeling, man. Um, but we are going to call a couple people up. So Garrett and Mackenzie Harrison are uh, leaving. They're moving back to Tiffin. Um couple hours away, this is where the Lord has called them and prepared them to go. So it's one of the, the harder parts of not just ministry, but being involved in a church family because Jesus moves people. It's what he does. He's got assignments for people everywhere and places that he can use them to do his good and to love people and be loved and there are, there are people in, in Tiffin that only Garrett and Mackenzie can love and, and reach, and God is going to work through them in an amazing way. And uh, so hearts are heavy that they're leaving. I've come to know uh, Garrett over the past year in particular, and he's a brother. And I'm sad to see him go, but thankful for what the Lord is going to do for him there. And, and Tiffin and what he's going to do through him and Mackenzie and Tiffin. It's going to be an amazing thing, and I, I can't wait to hear about it. And uh, I was talking to their pastor uh, a few days ago, and um, I, I told him that they were really gaining a great couple and because uh, they already have a church that they went to in Tiffin. Um, so they're, they're already plugged into the church there and everything. I told them that they're going to have a – they're really gaining a, a great couple. And uh, – he had said that, you know, he'd love to get the whole family back. And I told him we were going to be fighting. <laughs> but he ain't getting them back. I'm just, I'm just letting you know. But um, anyway, so we, uh, we want to send them off the right way. Um, we want to call them up here. And uh, as a church, we just want to pray over them and pray for God's goodness and his, his grace and uh, his leading in their life. So, um, guys, will you you come forward, and um, and and church, you who are willing, if you come forward, we're just gonna lay hands on them and pray over them as, before they before they go, before they go. So I'll go ahead and uh, and start praying. And if anybody wants to jump in after that, just um just go ahead and and jump in. Um, Lord, thank you, thank you for Garrett and Mackenzie for 
bringing them here to this church. Thank you for the blessing that they've been, Father. Thank you for the blessing they, they're going to continue to be. Um, when you move people, Father, you have a plan and you have a purpose for it. You don't do anything just out of carelessness or anything like that, Lord. You do everything with intentionality. So we pray, Father, that you would just guide them to what you have for their life while they're there, Jesus. We pray that you would, you would give them wisdom and discernment to walk in the path that you have laid out for them, Father. Let it be a bright, shining fire, Father. Um, we pray that you would give them courage to do what you want them to do, Father. Sometimes what you've called us to do is scary, Jesus. And we just pray that, that coupled with the wisdom and discernment that you give them, that you would give them courage to, to listen and to obey what you have called them out for, Father. We pray that you would bless their home that they're moving to, Lord Jesus. We pray that it would be a place of peace and refuge and love. Uh, we pray for Mackenzie with this baby, Father, that you would bless this child, that um, they would grow, be full of health, that this would be a child that chases after you, um, that seeks you, that knows you, that from an early age, Lord, this child is, is filled with your spirit and filled with your love. Uh, we pray that you would bless them. Uh, Garrett and McKenzie as parents, Father, it is a, a tough thing to raise a child. It is a sobering task that you've called us to as parents, Father. We pray that they would, they would raise this child in a way that, that the Bible teaches us to do which is not easy to do, Father, but we just pray that you would give them supernatural strength, um, that you would give them, um, along this time, that you would give them wisdom, wisdom to know when to, when to correct um, the child, wisdom to know when to show grace. Sometimes we don't know, Father, it's just tough. There's no guidebook for how to do this the right way, but we have you, and uh, you are more than what we need, Father. Um, we pray that they would just know your love, know your, your tangible presence there with them. We pray that this, the church that there, that's there with them, Father, they would come up alongside them and, uh, and show them love and, and guide them and help them and just be a blessing to them, Father. Um, we pray all these things in your name, Jesus.